Jesus. Praise God. You can shake hands with about three people and say, God has something good for you. And you may be seated. Bible says there's a time to shout, there's a time to keep quiet, there's a time to weep, there's a time to cry, there's a time to laugh, and uh, you have to be sensitive to what the Spirit of God is doing. And I sense that sometimes, uh, because we are from Asian cultures, we do not understand the dance and the rejoicing of God. So we must realize that if our culture comes against the Word, which do we choose? The Word. Nothing wrong with culture if it's not against the Word. I mean, the way you dress, beautiful, according to your culture. But any point where the culture contradicts the Word, I don't care whether it's from a different country or Asian country, but when it clashes with the Word, we have to choose the Word. We have to follow the word. So here we have in the Bible, this morning, we're talking on the, we're going to look into the life of Moses. And uh, we experience the rejoicing that they have, the great deliverance that they have. Remember that for 400 years, they have been bound. 400 years of bondage. I can assure you, you'll be rejoicing when God delivered you from that kind of bondage that they have been in. And church is a place where we rejoice and be glad. It's a time when we are quiet and still in His presence. It is also a time when we rejoice and be glad. I'm sure none of you show your gladness in your house or when you're happy, you just walk around the house and say, I'm very glad. Praise God. No, I'm sure when something nice happens in your family, something good, you will say, Hallelujah, if you're a Christian. In fact, many times you can tell a Christian by their hallelujahs. There, there's something in you that bursts forth. So here we are talking about the life of Moses. And we want to trace right from the beginning how it all started. And uh, you read about it in Exodus how he was born and he was a proper child. His family saw that he was a, a wonderful child. There were basically three periods in Moses' life. Three periods in Moses' life. The first period was his experience in the world. The second period was his experience in the wilderness. The third was his experience with God. He lived exactly 120 years. Sharp. 80 of those years were wasted years. There's a song that goes in the Christian circle that says, Wasted years, wasted years, oh how foolish. Remember that our time is valuable. Time is the most precious commodity that God has ever given you. Every one of us has the same amount of time. 80 of those years was wasted. 40 wasted in the world. 40 wasted in the wilderness until he met God. But somehow through all these things, God's hand was still moving in his mercy. Before you know God, God is already working. Moses did not even know God when he was a baby. He did not know how to respond to God. He had no knowledge of God. Yet, when he was a child, God was already working and preserving his life. Some of your lives, if you trace back very carefully, the Holy Spirit will remind you 
That even before you knew God, He knew you and He was drawing you to Himself. Jesus said, No man cometh unto me except the Father draw him. No man cometh unto me, Jesus said, except the Father draw him. And the Father has been drawing your lives to Him even before you knew Him. The first 40 years of Moses' life was doing what he could. Learning all the talents he had. He was educated in the ways of the Egyptian. Let's look at the book of Acts chapter 7. We know from the book of Exodus that Pharaoh's daughter brought, her, brought him up. And in Acts chapter 7, it tells us the training of Moses. I read the Jewish historian Josephus. And he wrote about how Moses was trained up and he was well known, he was quite famous as an Egyptian warrior. He was famous in the worldly sense, worldly fame. Acts chapter 7, verse 20 to 22. At this time Moses was born and was well pleasing to God and he was brought up in his father's house for three months when he was sent out Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians I repeat all the wisdom of the Egyptians he was educated in the best primary schools, the best Egyptian kindergarten. In fact, he went to the royal kindergarten. He was brought up in the best primary schools in Egypt. He was educated in the best colleges. He was educated in the best Egyptian universities. So his head had grown big with knowledge, learning, of all the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds he was a very talented man by all natural circumstances by the time he was 40 years old he was what the world would call a success he was what the world would call someone to follow. He was what the world would call a famous man. And all these things serve only to make him have one thing, which would do, which would happen, like Paul says, knowledge puffs up. After 40 years of all this learning, Moses actually became proud. I want to emphasize that point so that you will understand later when the Bible says he was the meekest man on earth. Before that happened, he was proud. Proud as proud can be. He was filled with pride at his strength, pride as to his eloquence, pride filled his life. Great learning produced pride. Knowledge passed up, but love edifies. So all this pride filled Moses in the next verse, verse 23. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Remember that Moses was brought up by his own family. If you remember the story, the little uh, baby Moses was in the river. Miriam was hiding in the bulrushes, following where the baby would go. And uh, Pharaoh's daughter was in the river. And... She saw the baby and she liked the baby. Miriam quickly ran to Pharaoh's daughter and said, Could, Would you like me to find a nurse for the baby? And uh, the Pharaoh's daughter said, Yes. And uh, she got 
her own mother. So Moses was brought up by his own parents. So to a certain extent, I'm sure his parents would have told him the secret things. Who he really was. That he was an Israelite. Although he was brought up by Pharaoh's daughter as a prince. A prince among men. When he was 40 years old, he knew that he was an Israelite. Not only that, the Bible records us an incident which most of you are familiar, but for those of you who are not familiar, I'm just going to just summarize it for you. When he was 40 years old, he went and visited the Israelites. When he went to visit the Israelites, he saw the two Israelites fighting. Uh, he saw a, an Israelite and an Egyptian fighting. So they were fighting among themselves and Moses, remember he was strong in word and deed. Possibly, possibly, he was a tough man. And so here comes Moses. He, he came, saw the fight, he gave one punch to the Egyptian and the next moment the, uh, the Egyptian was dead. This tough guy. This is Prince Moses. The Bible records the story in the Old Testament but didn't record why he did it. Didn't record why he did it. The New Testament records why he did it. Acts chapter 7. Acts 7. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts 7. There is, says, in verse 24, Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian. He was a murderer. Verse 25. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Here in verse 25 says, the reason why he killed the Egyptian is because he supposed in his mind that by doing that, the Israelites will understand that he is their deliverer. I repeat, by killing the Egyptian, Moses was actually conveying to the Israelites by his action, saying, hey fellas, here I am, I am your deliverer, pow! That was the message he wanted to give them. That he was the deliverer. Moses knew God called him. He knew in his heart that God has a plan for his life. And that involved with that plan is the deliverance of the Israelites. So he saw a vision, he, he has a vision inside him. He saw God's plan in his life. He knew that God has chosen him as someone special to deliver the Israelites. Did he get his vision right? That's right, isn't it? He was a deliverer to the Israelites. That was the right message, that was the right vision. He got the right vision, but he used the wrong methods. His purpose and motive was right, but his methods were wrong. And the, and the end doesn't justify the means. His methods were wrong. Wrong methods does not justify you even if your motives were right. He had pride. He used his own strength. That was one example of this 40 years training, what he can do for him. And I said it before, I believe in one of the Wednesdays meeting, that if you have a call of God in your life, your greatest training is to know the Holy Spirit. It is not to get more education, no Bible school, no seminary, no school of the Holy Spirit, no school of ministry can give you only what it requires from your walk with God. The greatest asset you have in your life 
If you are called of God to a ministry, you should know the Holy Spirit. That's your main goal. For Jesus said that I have sent him and he will teach you all things. Surely you want him. And Jesus said that he will bear witness together with you. Moses did not depend on God's strength to do the work. It was an abomination to God. When God gives you a vision, you must wait on God for His anointing to do it. God called Elisha to be a prophet in 1 Kings 19. Elijah called Elisha to be a prophet in his place. The calling was clear. But for 10 years, he did not do a prophet's office until the anointing came on him in 2 Kings chapter 1 and chapter 2. See, when God calls you, we all know the phrase, God is looking for your availability, not your ability. And when you give to God your availability, you also must wait on God for the ability. The word dunamis means God's ability. See, there are four Greek words for power. Exousia means authority. Dunamis means the ability given to you. Acts 1 verse 8. When the Holy Spirit has come on you, you shall receive power. You shall receive my ability. God's ability in your life to do His work, to be a, to be a witness. And that also includes all of us who do not have a call to the ministry. That means God has a ministry in your life, in the secular world, or in various forms of ministry to the body of Christ, that you will need that ability and anointing on your life to equip you for God's vision. To know that God called you, to know what God asked you to do is not enough. Which is what many people do. They, they hear God's call and they run. They did not wait on God for the spirit of might to come on them. The ability of God to anoint them for their work. And if you try, like Moses, you will end up a failure. You will end up a failure. He end up a failure. That end his first 40 years of his life. I'm not spending much time on the first two 40 years. I'm spending more time on the last 40 years. So I'm just summarizing for you. He ran away into the wilderness. And for 40 years, he forget about everything. I mean, he was no more interested in that vision. It was 40 years of discouragement, 40 years of depression, 40 years of saying, God, forget it. I don't want to have, to have anything to do with all this, this deliverance ministry. After he was called to be the deliverer, he knew it. If you say, Moses, do you know it? He would say, I know it. The reason why he killed the Egyptian was because he said he was a deliverer. Say, God, I don't want this deliverance ministry. He ran away for 40 years. He settled down. He got married to an Ethiopian woman. He had two sons born to his family, Gershom and Eliezer. And the story goes, and they live happily ever after. Under the burning bush. He was settled, he was a shepherd, and he was there. He pushed the vision to the back of his mind. Sometimes during the 40 years, he may have the vision come to him. I mean, the, the desire, God's calling, and, and he would just push it aside. Some of us have been there. I have been there. Jerry Savell said, I believe it was Jerry Savell, to say that when God first called him, oh yes, now I remember, that, I mean, he struggled in this first part of his ministry. Many times he felt like giving up, pushing away that vision. He was called when he was 12. But he didn't enter until he was in the middle age. Then Cho Yonggi says that the, in the first time of his ministry, he packed his bags. I forgot how many times it was about, probably about eight, eight times and wanted to leave. Many of us have been there. God gave you a vision, God gave you a call, you didn't succeed at first. 
You are now in the wilderness. Shepherd, with a shepherd's rod, happily married, everything settled, all your needs are met. After all, Jethro is your father-in-law and he's quite a nice guy. But I want you to know, no matter how settled you are physically, as long as you are not doing all that God wants you to do, you will never be happy. You will never be happy. You will never be satisfied. There will be something gnawing you from the inside. That says there is this that is not fulfilled, that is not done. So, after 40 years, remember when God first met him in Exodus chapter 3? Moses said, I am not eloquent. He's actually lying. The Bible says in Acts 7, he was very powerful in words. And indeed, see, he could have great articulation. I'm sure he must have, he must have gone to school and have great orat uh, oratory and uh, eloquent speeches that, that spellbound the Egyptian students. Here he stand before the burning bush and he said, God, uh, I'm not eloquent. Cannot talk. God said, who make man's mouth? And he said, God, send somebody else. Send uh, Aaron, 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 my elder brother. So he tried to push away his responsibility so much that now you see his reaction is the opposite. Why did he react that way? Because he has given up. I want you to know even when you give up, God did not give up. Even when you give up, God did not give up. Moses has given up, God did not. He encouraged him and he, and he led him and he nudged him lightly into the ministry that God has for his life. So let's look at Exodus chapter 3 and pick up from there. And we want to focus most of our time on this last 40 years which were the most fruitful years of his life in Exodus chapter 3. There are many things that we could teach in the life of Moses but as I have said, I want to focus on his weaknesses and his strong points so that you can identify with him that he was not a perfect man yet God used him so that you can be encouraged that God will use you too. Moses had pride in his early days and pride was completely emptied out in the wilderness now in Exodus chapter 3, when God confronted him, he kept giving excuses. Verse 11, Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? The first 40 years, he was, I am who? He is in the who is who Egypt records. Egyptian record of who is, who is who. But here he was in the first 40 years, I am who? Who? Prince Pharaoh. A prince Moses. Now 40 years in the wilderness, he says, Who am I? Who am I? God says, I want to send you. Who am I? God sends somebody else. Who am I? He's really down in this carriage. And God encouraged him, gave him his word, gave him the ministry, gave him the signs and the wonders. God said unto Moses, chapter 4, they continue the conversation. Verse 1, Moses said, If they say to me, if I go to them and say, You send me, 
they will say you didn't appear to me and then the Lord gave him signs sign and wonders ministry gave him some signs powerful signs when he received all those signs and he started going back I want you to realize that Moses is like you and I when we do something fresh in God here he is he took the signs and he went back to the Israelites and Moses uh, and Aaron together went to the Israelites and they pronounced all the things before God uh, and before Pharaoh in chapter 5 we are now in chapter 5 verse 1 Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh thus says the Lord God of Israel let my people go that they may hold a feast to me Pharaoh said who is the Lord who is the Lord challenge them and this is what Moses did and said uh, after he answered them in uh, verse 5 Pharaoh said look the people of the land are many now and you make them rest from their labor you, you are disturbing them from their work you, you got strange ideas wanting to bring these people out into the wilderness to, to worship God you have very strange ideas and Pharaoh said let all these people work harder now we are going to tell them to make the same amount of bricks but we are not going to give them the material they are going to find their own material and they are still going to make the same amount of bricks because of this Moses disturbing guy nuisance and all the Israelites came back to Moses in verse 20 Moses didn't have an easy time they came up from Pharaoh and verse 20 they met Moses and Aaron Ms. Moses and Aaron must be waiting outside for the good news they came with bad news they said let the Lord look on you judge you because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us now you make our life more difficult Moses so they, they actually came against Moses what did Moses do? he did what every normal first timer in the Lord do he came back to God and this is what he said this is very interesting have a close look at your Bible look carefully in your Bible so you know I'm not making this up in Exodus chapter 5 verse 22 Moses came to the Lord and he said Lord why have you brought trouble on these people why is it you have sent me since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name he has done evil to these people neither have you delivered your people at all now here you must catch what Moses have to learn Moses have to learn that you need endurance he actually was telling God say God why why didn't you deliver them you send me you say that that I'm supposed to go as a messenger and bring forth deliverance here I am I give the message to them no deliverance in fact it got worse any of you have stood on God's word and it got worse Moses did it got worse and when it got worse he came back to God he complained to God he poured his sorrows to God he put the blame back on God why did you send me why he didn't deliver them instantly Moses actually expected that the Israelites to be delivered instantly he expected results immediately and anyone in the ministry will tell you 
who is a success today will tell you that a ministry take endurance and any one of you successful in the world out there working for God while holding a secular job will tell you that where they are successful today is because of endurance Moses did not have the endurance that was required at first he was one who gave up easily give up easily here something difficult he complained to God want to give up again he learned he learned through all these times and God was so patient I like the father he was so patient with Moses he was forming him into the vessel that he wants Moses to be he saw all his weaknesses but he took him and slowly spoke to him slowly instructed him when God gives you a vision you begin to obey God remember that faith and patience are two twin forces needed required to conquer and break the way to God's promised land you need faith to take the risk you need patience to stand having done all stand and if you will stand long enough God will bring you through into that which is promised for you and, and the rest of the life of Moses we're going to study is crisis experience because I believe that your true character your true spiritual level is when a crisis happens it's not when everything is going easy and you are, you are just saying praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow everything is flowing smoothly everything going normally and you are saying hallelujah what a great Christian you are that is not testing you yet your true character the true person you are is when a crisis is in your life it's when difficulties come persecutions arise and they say all people say all kinds of things about you until your name is worse than the burn kettle pot black and uh, they will persecute you they will make life difficult for you that's the time that who you are as a Christian and where you are as a Christian really stands out I mean I am not impressed with people who can behave normally under normal circumstances but I can guarantee you I'm impressed by Christians who in difficulty and in crisis stood firm and made the good confession of faith and say praise God hallelujah I'm gonna rejoice still that impresses me and that is the type of Christians we want God wants us to be in hard times you're joyful you're you're practicing God's word that is the truth of who you really are inside and we are gonna look at Moses in crisis time you've seen his first crisis here he failed miserably miserably he was not the man of God that you thought he was that, that he don't have he was just perfect I mean everything is under control when they came to him and saying work has got hard they say everything is under control the ten plagues are on the way wouldn't it be nice to be able to say that no he went back to God and he complained he started like you and I some of you are looking so innocent as if you have never ever complained to God sweet innocent thing you're looking there that's not me that's my neighbor the one next to me sometimes people hear the message and they say that's right that's right that's what the brother over there but not for me looks as if you never complain I did in my earlier life when I first started the ministry I would 
I would, if God has a shoulder that is visible, I would lean on that shoulder and cry in my earlier days. But the only problem was God was invisible. So all you have to do, bend down on your knees and cry unto God. Oh God, look what happened. And I learned that your success or failure in life is determined by your reactions in a crisis, not your reactions in a normal time. I mean, your reactions in a normal time are important too. But more vitally important, where you are really, and what you are really, is when the crisis time hits, when it's difficult. And I praise God that in this time of uh, renovation, all of you really exemplify the wonderful spirit-filled Christian life. Amen? I mean, probably some of you got knocked on your nails with a hammer. Boom! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! If you're in the final Holy Ghost Christian, take their hand, squeeze it hard. If a hallelujah comes up, that's the Holy Ghost. Son. If you say, Adoy! Well, then need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Somehow, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, everything happens, say hallelujah. You know, on fine day over the phone, somebody you're sharing me a, a very, very uh, sad crisis story, and you're sharing on the phone. I was sharing, before I could stop my mouth, sometimes your mouth moves ahead of your head, of your brain. Before I could say anything, I heard myself say, hallelujah. The, the, the other person on the other end got shocked. Hallelujah. You mean you say hallelujah to this problem? Uh, and I say, oh, excuse me, I'm not saying hallelujah for what happened, but I'm saying hallelujah for what is going, God is going to do. God always got his face. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, it's what happens in a crisis that's important. And I'm going to show crisis time in Moses' life. In all that God worked out in his life. There are times that they rejoice. The ten plagues happen, and all the Egyptians were struck, but the Israelites were protected. Finally comes the day of deliverance. As they came right to the Red Sea, they see the beautiful scenic waters, mountains on one side. They did not say, what a nice place this is. Because suddenly they heard chariot wheels. Some effects might. Coming forth. And Moses was there with his special rod. Right at the Red Sea. And the chariots are coming forth. The sea is on one end. The mountains are on one end. I like to see what a person do in that time. I really like to see what a person do at that time. Like Cole Stringer, uh, he used to say, I like him. He says, he likes joy. And he's someone who likes to exemplify joy. One of the first things that leave your life in a crisis is joy. Right. Have you ever heard the bad news? The first thing that people hear bad news, what happened? Joy leaves the room. And so he wanted to see in a crisis experience what what a person does in a crisis. He likes to watch people. I also like to watch people. See what they do in a crisis. And he took this minister for hunting. You know, he, he likes to hunt. And uh, I mean, they went duck shooting or something in Darwin. They shot the ducks and took this minister. And, and, and this minister was so late that he had to catch his flight. And uh, so there they were, they quickly packed the ducks in a, in a basket, uh, in a plastic bag, and uh, he had to quickly run and drive him to the airport straight from the hunting field, with the ducks all over him. <laughs> then he is going to the airport, trying to catch his plane, and uh, book his reservation there, and get his seat ready, and they were already calling the boarding call. So by the time he reached the airport with the ducks all over him, he, he came, and of all things, he fell down. He fell down, and, and, and when this minister fell down, all the ducks were scattered all over the nice, beautiful, air-conditioned, carpeted airport. And you could see blood all over, ducks all over the place, feathers all over the place. And Kostringer was looking there, psychologist is here. 
watching what he will do. And the next thing he did was this minister laugh. He just lie on the floor and laugh. He laughed and he laughed, pick up his ducks and go on his seat. Now isn't that better than crying and losing your flight? How, you re- how do you react in a crisis? I remember a time when Jerry Savelle was t- talking about how he came back from South Africa. And they gave him a crocodile case. A crocodile skin case. Uh, no, is it alligator? Alligator skin. And uh, he got all the permit, etc. to say that it's alligator skin because crocodile is banned in the state. And so he bought alligator skin. And it was all nice suitcase, alligator suitcase he got from South Africa. They gave it to him. And he was carrying it, checked in uh, into the American immigration. And as they put it there, the custom officer says, this is crocodile. He said, no, this is alligator. Custom officer said, this is crocodile. Say no, he took up his papers and said, sure, I show you here. It's written A L L I L E Gator. Not crocodile. Custom say, this is crocodile. Now he was in a crisis, he's gonna lose his joy. While he was arguing with the officer, another officer came, opened his suitcase, started emptying his all his possession into a, a chocolate box. They were going to confiscate his bag, his briefcase. And so they put it all into the chocolate box and he was talking to this man, etc. And, uh, and he was about to lose his joy. And finally he left it there. He, his wife was with him and uh, I mean he was glum. He, he, hasn't, he hasn't quite gone into sorrowing yet. But there's a point in between the joy and the sorrow and you're just in the fence, very thin fence. Just about to go on that side. And his mouth was just there. And he held his chocolate box with all his precious passport things, etc. inside. And he was holding his chocolate box out from the customs office with his wife next to him. He was feeling really, really that he was going to lose his joy. In fact, he said he felt he was going to sin and then ask for forgiveness. Give a follow punch and then ask for forgiveness. <laughs> he was going to lose his joy. And as he was carrying the chocolate box, walking, he happened to pass by a mirror <laughs> at the airport. And as he passed by the mirror, he saw himself with the chocolate box under his arm, looking at his face. He laughed. <laughs> and suddenly, all the tension left. If you live that way, you're going to be very healthy. See, it's what happens in a crisis that's important. How you react. Let's look at the character of Moses in a crisis. There they were with a mountain on one side, the sea on the other side, the chariots behind them, and God with them. In Exodus chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14 verse 12 How did the Israelites react? The Israelites said in uh, verse 11 Because there were no graves in Egypt you have taken us to die in the wilderness Now wouldn't you say that that is just compromising in the circumstances? The Red Sea on one side, the mountain on one side, the Egyptian army behind them, and they say, Moses, you brought us here to bury us. Smart fellow, you. You brought us here to bury us. Why do you do it like that to us? It's not the word uh, that we tell you in Egypt saying, let us alone. It would be better for us to serve in Egypt and die in the wilderness and you didn't leave us alone. Moses this time was holding steady and he said stand stand still and you will see the salvation of the Lord the Lord will fight for you you will hold your peace verse 15 the Lord said to Moses 
Why do you cry to me? Between verse 14 and verse 15, Moses cried to God. Can you all say, Moses cried to God. You're going to hear that phrase very often. He cried to God and said, God, help! And God said, what is that in your hand? Use it. Use it. He used that rod, lifted it up, and he saw the power of God splitting the Red Sea. And the same group of murmuring, grumbling, complaining Egypt, uh, Israelites, suddenly, they were singing across the Red Sea. Hallelujah! Moses, what a jolly good fellow! What a jolly good fellow! What a jolly good fellow! Oh, Moses is. They crossed the Red Sea, and after all the singing and praising, they felt very thirsty. Look around for water, no water. Oh, this Moses. Just after the worship service. Just after the worship service, the praise session, glory to God, gloria adios. Worshipping and praising along, all along the way. We read here in chapter 17 verse 1. All the congregation of the Israelites set out on a journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and came in Rephidim. There was no water. No water for the people. Verse 2, the people said, Give us water. Give us water. Verse 3, the people murmured. The same guys who were singing along saying, I will sing unto the Lord for He has run gloriously. Hey, where's water? <laughs> same fellas. Within the same day. Same day. I, I, I want to encourage you, when you leave this service, you have many opportunities to complain and murmur. In your house, in your home, everywhere. What do you do in that crisis? Here they are complaining to Moses and they say the same thing. They say, verse 3, Why is it that your brothers out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock? Always they say, Moses, you're killing us. Moses, you're killing us. Moses, you're killing us. In the end, they receive what they, what they confess. They all got killed. Every time a crisis happens, Moses, you're killing us. Moses, you're killing us. God is killing us. God is killing us. They got killed. Believe, confess, receive. Verse 4. Can you all say that together? And Moses, Moses. cried. Very clever now. He's a good crier. And Moses cried. He came to God and cried. After who else could he cry on? He cried out to God. What shall I do? These people are ready to stone me. The same people who sang together with me, danced together with me, they are ready to stone me now, Lord. And you know, Lord, in the wilderness, there are also a lot of stones. He cried to the Lord. The Lord wrought a miracle. And upon that miracle, everybody got their feel. Everybody had something to drink. The next problem that they would have is the food problem. Now, I just want you to turn to the book of Numbers and have a look at one statement here as we go through so that you will have a pattern to follow. The book of Numbers is just after Leviticus. Chapter 14, verse 22.
Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have put me to the test now these ten times. They actually complained ten times. There were ten crises experience up to chapter 14. If you continue, you will see five more, 15 times. But up to that time was 10 times. And the number of the Israelites was estimated by many Bible scholars, including women, children, etc. to be about 3 million people. How do you like to lead a group of 3 million people who are about to stone you? So we have Exodus chapter 5, the first time Moses came to them, they complained. They murmured. Exodus chapter 14, verse 11, that we have just seen. Moses uh, had them coming against him at the Red Sea, complaining. And we just look at Exodus 15, verse 24. Third time. And Exodus chapter 16, verse 2. Exodus chapter 16, verse 2. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full, for we have brought, for you have brought us out in the wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. What did they say? Kill again. They say, you bring us out here to kill us with hunger. Now they, they have water problem, now food problem. Say, Moses, no food. We are going to stone you. Produce the food. That is a crisis experience. And Moses turned to God again. And I just want you to notice what they say. They say that we remember the pots of meat and the bread we ate in Egypt. Do you know, realize what they were thinking of? They were thinking of all their lamb chop, barbecue that they enjoy in Egypt, all the food. What happened was even though they were redeemed from Egypt, they were separated from Egypt in the flesh, yet Egypt was in their mind. Christians, you are redeemed from the world. But the world can be in your mind and it can cause problems. They were separated from Egypt completely. Egypt was completely destroyed. But Egypt was still in their mind. They need the renewal of the mind. Their mind and their vision was still Egypt. They had an Egypt mentality instead of having a Mount Sinai mentality. And Christians can be, can be uh, in the Lord, separated from the world, yet the world is in your mind. The world's ways are in your mind. Now, I will just give you, for you to take notes, these 10 occasions, we will not touch on all of them, but just for your interest in your Bible study. And we will just focus on the character of Moses and his reaction. In Exodus chapter... 16 verse 2 is the fourth time. The fifth time is Exodus chapter 16 verse 27. The sixth time is Exodus 17 verse 5. The seventh time is Exodus 32 verse 1. The eighth time is Numbers chapter 11 verse 1. The ninth time is Numbers chapter 11 verse 4. And the tenth time is Numbers chapter 14 verse 1. That was when God told them in Numbers 14, 22, 10 times. Then, after the 10 times, another 5 more times. The 11th time was Numbers chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. 12th time was Numbers chapter 16, verse 41. 13th time was Numbers chapter 20, verse 3 to 5. 14th time was Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 to 5. 15th time was Numbers chapter 25, verse 1 to 3. 
Now, in all these crises, Moses reacted at times. He was not perfect. Sometimes he fell, he fall like some of us fall. And uh, Moses, on one of those occasions, one of those many occasions in those crises, most of the time in the crisis, if you read, you will find Moses cry to God. Moses cry to God. Moses cry to God. Moses cry to God. Sounds like some of our stories. We are crying out unto God constantly. We are crying for God to help us in our situation. But there was a time when Moses really broke. You know, there's a limit to the endurance of a man, even a man of God. There's a limit to your endurance. There was a time when it, it, it came so hard at Moses, that Moses literally broke. Could not stand anymore under the crisis. I want you to look at that occasion. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11, that was the ninth time. We're looking at Moses and his character. The Israelites again complain. And as they complain, I want you to note one verse there in Numbers chapter 11 verse 4. Do you have Numbers 11 verse 4? Now the mixed multitude. Do you know what it means mixed multitude? There were some who were half Egyptian, half Israelite. See, it's a mixture of the world's ways and God's ways that produce the most problems. If every Christian were to follow the word of God, there will be unity in the church in the whole world. It's always a mixed multitude. Either we have worldly ways bringing it to implement, implementation, or worldly ways of reacting. The only way you can have, a, have an argument or strive is when two persons, if it's with two persons. You cannot have a strive with yourself. You need two persons to get in the quarrel. If one is in the flesh, the other is in the flesh, finish. Good fight. If one is in the flesh, the other is in the spirit, no fight. Because the spirit will not fight the flesh. The one who walks in the spirit will not react to the one in the flesh. It takes flesh and flesh to react. And if one is in the spirit and the other is in the spirit, divine harmony. So see, there's no way, no way if you walk in the spirit for you to have an argument in your family, for you to have an argument in church, for you to have been in disharmony with any human being on earth, if everyone walk in the spirit. After all, everyone is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, hallelujah. How, how can you argue? You can't. It's the mixed multitude. That is why God does not ordain for a believer to mix with an unbeliever. I mean in marriages. It causes problems. They say, oh brother, God spoke to me after uh, I married a person, that the person will be converted. Who knows, you may be unconverted. Excuse me for saying that, but... Uh, it may be the other way around. It may be pulled into the world. You may, you may lose your spiritual zeal and go off. The priority is a spiritual realm. The mixed multitude. Well, in Numbers, Numbers chapter 11, the mixed multitude complained. This time, they really went a bit further. You see how much they can, they can confess. Egypt. Their mind even see visions. This is the vision they saw in verse 5. We remember. We remember the fish. 
Last time they talked they, about the meat and the bread. Now they say, we also remember Egyptian fish. Oh my, if you, if you have never tasted Egyptian, Egyptian fish, you don't know what is it like. Makes your mouth water. Egyptian fish. And, and, and we also remember the cucumber. How ridiculous they can sound in such an important time. The melons. I would say they really meditated. They meditated on the food in Egypt. Could you imagine how many years have passed by? Here they are. Here they are. The tabernacle has been built. They took take to a year. So it's about two years. And they still remember how the fish tastes like. That, that, that fish, wow. Sambal fish. And the cucumber, wow, wow. That's something else. The melons, the leeks, the onions. Very detailed. They really have been studying. And the garlic. The fish kurma. Oh my, they say. And you only give us mana. Mana. Every day we see mana. Mana. They didn't know your angel's food. So they complain again, and this time, this is what we want to see. Moses reaches maximum. Could not take it anymore. Moses reached a breaking point. And he says to the Lord in verse 11, why did you afflict your servant? He's blaming God for his problems. God, why do you cause me this suffering? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of these people on me? Did I conceive them? Look at how Moses talked to God. Say, God, they are not my children. These three million fellows, you know, clawing on me, say, food, 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 garlic, garlic, cucumber, melon, melon. I mean, they got all kinds of things. And Moses said, this fellow is crying after me. They are not my children. He's complaining now. That should I carry them like a nursing baby? You know, Moses has been doing some meditation. He's saying, God, this... These three million guys, it's as if I'm carrying them like a nursing baby. You know, three million of them. They want food. Ah, okay, food here. They, oh, okay, here, here. Okay, oh, here, here. Moses was getting quite fed up. He was going to drop the whole baby. Here he was. And he said, God, verse 14. This is what Moses said. He said, God, I cannot take it anymore. I am not able. It's too heavy. The people are crying now. Moses is crying now. Only God didn't cry yet. God was angry. And Moses said in verse 15, If you treat me like this, O God, please kill me. Here and now, kill me, Lord. Doesn't that sound like Elijah? Praying there, under the tree, and say, Lord, kill me now. Kill me, let me die now. If he really wanted to die, he should run towards Queen Je Jezebel. After all, Queen Jezebel was after his life. Moses said, God, please kill me. If he wanted to be killed, he should have stand in front of the Israelites and say, Hey, go ahead and stone. He actually was asking for sympathy. If he really wanted to die, he, he would have uh, uh, gone to the Israelites, let them stone, stone him. But he's actually breaking down. He said, Moses broke down? Yes. 
And this point of breaking down is after he saw the Lord's glory. After he came down from the mount with his face shining of God's glory. Remember, you are still in your mortal body. Unless you constantly commune with God, there is a breaking point. After he saw God's glory, the tabernacle has been filled with the glory of God. He has saw the, the full, so much of God that no other human being has seen up to that time. Yet in this crisis, he was looking to his own ability. He said, I... Do you notice that? Do you notice a lot of eyes now? In, in, in uh, verse 11 onwards. Your servant. He says, Have I not on me? Verse 12. I. And verse 13. I. Verse 14. I. Verse 15. I. He is now at the point where he looked to himself, looked to him, his own ability, and he said, God, I cannot. Brethren, if you ever look to your own ability, you will always find nothing there. When Moses looked to himself, he said, I cannot. No way, oh God, release me, let me die. Why did he look to his circumstances? Because of the pressure of the circumstances. All the people, three million of them, crying except for a few good guys like Joshua, Caleb, and Aaron. I mean, all the rest were crying out, crying out. And when they were doing that, he looked into himself. And he found no strength. At the greatest point, of your struggle if you are facing a complete blank wall don't look to yourself look to God and God did a marvelous thing the problem was the food but the first thing he took care of was Moses the moment Moses said I cannot take it he said alright get me 70 men I will put my spirit on them Actually, you know what God was saying? Moses, it's the spirit that's on you, not you. And he was helping Moses to see that it was not him, but it was the spirit upon him that will enable him to do the work. When God calls, God enables, He put His spirit into you. So it was His spirit upon him. And He says, give me people. 70 people and he took the spirit that's on Moses put it upon them because Moses did not recognize that it was the spirit it was the spirit in his life it was the spirit in his life that would do the work he did not realize it so when he reached a breaking point that was one of the final times he ever reached a crisis? So much change in him. Remember I taught a series on grace. It's an important series. There are many times when I confronted situations. And I look inside me and I look around me and I say there's no way we can do this. Every time I reach that stage, I come before God and say, God, I draw more grace from you. Because grace is your ability to do what is beyond my ability. After the experience with God, Moses became the meekest man on earth. You have it here. Numbers chapter 12. Verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble. 
more than all men who are on the earth. He didn't just receive it as he was. Through all those crises experience, tribulation, worker, perseverance, Romans 5. All those difficult things that you confront are building your character as you practice the word today. I don't know if some of you are at your breaking point in your life. But at the point when you give up, that's when God is going to do more through your life. And Moses seemed to be a changed man from that day onwards. It took so many crises. But he reached a point where he really was different. He was changed. You seldom find a scripture that says of the man of God that they are the most humble and the meekest in the whole planet earth. But this is said of Moses. From the one of the most proud men, he has now reached the point where he is the most, he says here, the most humble and meek. He has won a great fight, conquered a great battle. And God, when He died, saw this precious vessel that He has formed. It was so precious that the, God, that the epistle of Jude tells us God specially sent an angel to take Moses' body. So that the Bible tells us when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration on the mountain, Moses appeared. That means that Moses didn't go down like all the others. He went up after he died. God is forming our character. He's teaching us through the crisis of life. Making us, molding us for what He wants us to be. So bow our heads in prayer. Father God, as we come before your presence, life is filled with crises, experiences, difficulties. But we know that in all these things we have an answer. It's not that when we came to know you, Father, that there is no problem. But the problems are there, but we have the answer and the solutions. And Father, through all the crises experience, we know that somehow in that process, imperfect though we be, though we be, though we have failed you in many ways, though our character did not match up to you, we thank you, Father, that if we just give our lives to you, you're able to mold us and make us after your very image. That is not by might, not by power, but by your spirit that your work is carried out. So Father God, you search our hearts right now. 
Search every one of our hearts. And if there is inside our heart the desire to give up, I pray that your spirit will begin to deal with lies here. That we will not give up, that we will stand firm. And that if in our hearts you see those places where we are looking into ourselves and we are saying we don't have the ability, we pray that your spirit will open our eyes to see you. That you are our ability, you are our strength in all these circumstances. Right now, in your presence we seek more and make us after your own image. Let's all stand to our feet. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit.